Good evening, and welcome back to the Game Master Happy Hour. Woo. Uh, I have to mute Tyler real quick because I'm hearing myself, but that's better. Um, my name is Adam, and I'm joined here by my good buddies from the failed Fortitude Save Collective. And tonight, we're going to have a discussion about what we can do when problems arrive at our tables. Now, whether it be scheduling issues, problem players, burnout, or boredom, these issues will arise at most tables. And, you know, if you play for a long time together, this is kind of an eventuality. So we decided that for tonight's happy hour, we would tackle some of these potential problems. But before we get into all that, it's been a while since we've like really talked about where we come from. Uh, so I want to reintroduce ourselves as this has been a big month for all of our shows in the uh, FFS Collective. So I wanted to give each of my co-hosts a chance to fill in on what's been going on in their world. So let's start with Allard. Oh, uh, yay. How you doing, uh, bud? Doing well. How are you? Great. So Allard is the GM for the Dice Crisis. And what they are doing is taking Second Darkness and converting it from 3.5 five to pathfinder 1e yes, sir. and i see that you have new digs what yes. gives where's the fireplace what's uh, been going on in the tdc world <laughs> well you see it's so exciting in the tdc universe right now we're pushing a, a our one year anniversary is coming up on the the 23rd you know right before christmas like like you all asked for yeah. uh, <laughs> but because of that we just so happen to be in a kind of big battle situation and i have half a combat sitting up on, on the on my table right now that i didn't want to want right. to you can't disturb, disturb the big mm -hmm. combat okay no siree right well so episode 50 was yeah was 50, you know yeah 50 well you had your episode 50 this month though yeah. right yeah it was, uh not this last monday but the monday before was the episode 50 um uh, i mean i'm not gonna spoil episode 50 if you haven't seen it no no it was no, a don't. it was a fun episode you know yeah yeah it's really a, got it's back a, to the roots it's a, a landmark right there um yeah. all right good cool well good to see you as <laughs> always um tyler i know that there's some cool stuff that's been happening over in minmax um and for those of you who don't know, uh, Min Max is a 2E rules-focused podcast doing Extinction Curse. Um, why don't you fill us in on some of the cool deets that have been happening over in Min Max? Yeah, so over here in Min Max land, uh, I don't know. I hate that name already. We'll, we'll think of something <laughs> else. We'll workshop it. Um, but oh, you mean Min Max? Min Max Land. Min Max know, like, Land. So you're kind of stuck with Min Max. Oh, I'm stuck with Min Max. <laughs> it's a little yeah. late. Uh, so now now you that I say Min Max out loud now for that, the first time. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. No, <laughs> I've only yeah. ever seen it spelled. If you check our if you check our Twitter, we've had Min Max since like 2015. <laughs> so I we better like it. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, no, we just recently hit a, another Patreon goal. So our once monthly starfinder homebrew that david is running is now going to happen bi-monthly and we got a release on the first and the 15th of every month now so we've got more starfinder content coming your way and uh we've got a lot of cool stuff working in the background right now i'm not really at liberty to talk about a lot of it but we've got some fun surprises in the next coming months for everybody Ooh. Oh, you're just you're just trying to tease us out here. Yeah, right? isn't that what that's see. teaser? That's what I we see. call it in the business, right? Uh, I see. Mm -hmm. You guys teaser. are all in the business. Is that what we call it, right? Yeah, we're the biz. <laughs> right. That's what we call it. Is yeah. it what we call it? <laughs> I don't know. That's why I asked. <laughs> I do in Minnesota. <laughs> I mean, if you know, you know. If you don't, you don't. I guess. Right. right. Uh, well, Griffin, how you doing, my good buddy? From I'm doing Lapa. well, man. You're, you're having a, good having a good you? time. Yeah. I'm getting excited. I'm excited for tonight. I love these nights. I'm yeah. the only one an hour. I'm an hour in the future from you guys, so I, know. I get to you stay up and drink an hour go. later. Exactly. <laughs> I'm drinking to a, a successful GM happy hour that I already know we had. <laughs> uh, well, so Griff here is the GM for the Hideous Laughter podcast, um, among others. Uh, let him talk about that a little bit. But they are their flagship show is doing Pathfinder One E. Um, and they're doing Carrion Crown, which is heavily modified. <laughs> oh, yeah, baby. Point. Um, 
you know, and so uh, I know y'all just had a crazy month. Of yeah, we've news. been uh, we've been doing it big <laughs> this past yeah. month. We uh, we became a partner of Paizo, so that was a big deal for us. It's been several months in the works, uh, a lot of document signing, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah. But we're excited, uh, and that let us launch a second show. So we launched the Link Legacy podcast, which is modules. You heard me talk on Game Master Happy Hour before about how much I love modules. We're doing them. We're doing a bunch of modules. Doing them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we started with me running the first one in the Link Legacy saga. I'm running Carnival of Tears, and it's, it's a great. lot of fun. Yeah. It's All so new much characters, fun. new cast member. Uh, it's it's a really good time. And with that, we're slowly but surely heading towards our second show on the network. That's in front of the paywall. So uh, no details to share on that one yet. Oh, you're but teasing it, too. I'm uh, teasing yeah. too. I'm teasing <laughs> too. There is a second show coming. We got a lot of support uh, when we when we announced that Paizo partnership. A lot of uh, a lot of folks up their Patreon subscription. A lot of fuck folks joined the Patreon. A lot you know, of fucks. A lot of fucks. A lot of fucks. Yeah. A lot of those fucks. So, that's what we're yeah. calling them. That's what we're calling <laughs> them. The fucks. Given. Well, that's the, that's the fans of the failed Fort Save. Mm -hmm. collective they're the fucks hmm. uh for fuck's sakes. <laughs> hold on check in chat are they okay with that guys for fuck's sakes fucks yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> i think um, everybody's on board some yeses <laughs> so it's been it's been a big month we've been having a lot of fun and we also i'm gonna get to this before you get to it we launched the uh the next chunk of hideous tom foolery oh, attack of the swarm i snagged it <laughs> <laughs> because I, I had to snag it because it's my character Sigurd has a big character reveal it is, in it, and it's it, really cool. So you is. should check that out. Um, yeah, uh, dude, hideous Tom Fuller is so much fun, and if any of you have not jumped into it, it's 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 what's well, a joint podcast between a couple folks from Hideous Laughter and a couple folks from Southern Tom Foolery, which that's where I'm from. If you didn't know that, listening to us here on the Southern Tom Foolery Discord. Um, yeah. But yeah, we're having a great time with it, and it's just so goofy. Like, I, I, like we get to cut loose with it, and it's a weird AP and a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, and Sigurd just had a big moment, so so it's exciting. Come listen um, to my sad, sad backstory if for nothing yeah, else. So sad. Regale us right now. No, I can't. I can't ah, spoil it. Spoiler. What the hell? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Another key yeah. industry term. <laughs> <laughs> spoilers spoilers yeah uh okay so my name's adam as i said and um if you're just joining us here for the first time somehow i am running some starfinder with southern Tom Foolery, and uh we've had a fairly big month uh got some really cool guests on our interview show since we last talked, we got to talk to Jason Tondro, which I know Tyler, you've got to talk to him, and he's just such a joy. That dude's a riot. Um, Love I mean, talking he's to incredible. him. Incredible. Yeah. And then we got to talk to Eleanor uh, Di Lorenzo from Androids and Aliens and the Lost Mountain Saga, her own podcast and all that. And that was just a, a really that was a kind of a special moment for me, being a big Androids and Aliens fan. Um, so that was really a lot of fun, and we're approaching episode 100 and the story has been ramping up like significantly and i cannot wait to share all these episodes with you and i'm planning something big for 100 but i'm not going to talk about it either <laughs> Ooh, got him teases up in here uh, right we at the dice crisis have big things going on too uh just, just letting you know <laughs> but i'll never tell i'm not gonna tell you what it is tell. but keep your eyes peeled <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, let's <laughs> let's get into why we're here tonight, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about those inevitable pesky little problems that pop up when you get five to six people meeting on a regular basis, all with their own agendas, with their characters or stories. So, some things happen, and real life too happens. Um, so, let's actually start with real life because I think that that's the the least uh, insidious one to talk about because sometimes things just happen and you know you could be going far along in a you know 
a campaign that you've been doing for a year and you got a buddy that has to move or has to go, you know, go out of town for several months, you know, what do y'all do when that kind of, when real life starts to encroach on the availability of the game? Hmm. I, I'll, the, I got, the... I got something. Okay. Go for it. I was just going to say that uh, I, I like uh, to kind of reference back to a previous episode of GM happy hour. I know like Adam has done some of this for people at his table. Um, but being able to take that opportunity, like find out from the person whether or not they're planning on rejoining, right? Don't mm -hmm. hold them hostage. Don't guilt them. The, you know, people have lives and they're more important than tabletop RPGs. Sorry, but what? they are, right? Real life. It depends life. on what you're yeah. doing with your life. Yeah. Let's you, just be real. I, so you're right. You're right. No. All right. Uh, no. Within well, takes you a couple ways. <laughs> right, right. Um, no, but I, I've always, I always like uh, the opportunity to cr for, for creation within constraints. I mean, if you mm -hmm. know when somebody's, if somebody's going to be gone for a set amount of time, or even if it's a undetermined amount of time, you know, find a fun way to remove them from the story and then reinsert them in a very memorable way. Mm -hmm. There's ways to I overcome that. I won't go that. into the whole story that we, cause you know, you can listen to the previous GM happy hour to hear it, but that's exactly what we did when, when Josh had to go for a few months, you know, in a, one of our older games that wasn't recorded. And I think to to the more broad point, it's about trying to creatively think through the availability and see if you can't manage to make it work somehow, you know? So what happens when it doesn't work? Like then that person you, is gone. They are they are gone for whatever real life re reason. They're out of here. You, you say, can you do one more session where I surround your player with five giants? <laughs> can you absorb three great X crits for me <laughs> very quickly? Yeah. Just show up, yeah. drink some beers, take some hits. We'll be good. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> you got to write them out. You know, I mean, that's that's it, it. It also depends on what kind of game you're playing, too. Right. Like if it's, you're not playing a very story heavy game and, and you're just kind of playing to to do with the mechanics and everything, then it's like, OK, well, he can't make it, you know, and that's that's fine and we'll move on without him or her and we're going to just go on to the next fight you know and but then if you if if you are telling a big story then yeah you have to you have to find a way to make it make sense you know and you don't always have to kill the character either you know you just you, you, they can retire they can be drawn to some other piece of the story that they can only do alone you know there's lots of things that you can do but I, I like what you said, Tyler, is don't hold them hostage and, and and just like lay down the guilt hammer because they got like an awesome job opportunity, you know, and had to take it, right? So then in your, in your opinion, are you, are you working like, cause I, cause I think I haven't really had this situation at a table, but in my mind, I'd be working with them with as much notice as they would give me to give them like a really cool send off but i right. kind of let them completely guide that like hey you know you're you're leaving the table in two months you're moving away you, you're not going to be a part of this anymore like mm -hmm. that's the decision we've come to do you want your character to like go out in a blaze of glory do you want to like go off on an adventure do you want me to kind of leave your story hanging i think those are all the kind of things that if that player gives you enough warning you can kind of work with but is is that what you're doing or you're kind of just like Okay, I'm gonna kill your character on your last no, session. No, <laughs> no. I, I mean, I would much rather do a, a more interesting story beat with it. You know, given if you got the lead time, there's no reason not to. And I certainly would, of course, let that that player drive drive what that is, what that looks like. You know, and, and try to work with them and give them a cool send off or a cool cool thing. I mean, that you know, and before we did the podcast, you know, we had a group of like 12 to 13 players that were playing in different arrangements in a lot of games. And so we had to deal with a lot of that, you know, like, uh, well, I can't do the Sunday game for a while. I'm going to be out for three weeks. And, you know, you, you try to write them out in a cool way. And, and if there's possibility for them to come back later, you leave the character alive and you leave, you leave that window open for them to slot back in when they can. And just, you know, 
if you're playing with your buddies, you want to you want to play with your buddies and make sure that everything is set up for them. You know, yeah. so I, have a, I have another take on this problem that I'm also curious about because this one I actually do encounter. Uh, the the long term leaving and life things, yeah, that that happens once in a while, right? But a lot of times, especially because we do almost all of our playing in person, a lot of times there's a person or two that can only make every other session or can only make every third session and they still want to be a part of the game, but it starts to feel like they're not really as much of a part of the game if they only make it half the time or only make it a third of the time. So how do you handle that kind of player? I mean, oof. have you ever seen the uh, the meta magic items that Paizo has put out? Tell us about oh, the, the meta meta, meta magic items. Now, yeah. like even the... even though I know what you're talking about, I want you to talk about it because if people haven't you know, heard about it, that's amazing. I don't remember exactly what it's called. I think it's like a scar or something that you get, or maybe a tattoo, or whatever. You can probably flavor it to be whatever you want, but. It, the thing is flavored. This person disappears un inexplicably just at random times, and they will come back at random times, and it does not change anything. And that's, like, basically the full description of the item <laughs> in-game. <laughs> so if you want, like, a quick trick like that, uh, they have those written out. Or there's a... And just a, another another one. There's like a little like crystal thing that you can that you can give everybody, so everybody can talk in their heads to everybody. So table talk becomes incorporated into the game via an item. That's uh, fun, man. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. I, I I don't remember the what the name of the uh, companion was called. Uh, but for my example on this, I've never had anybody be like, yeah, I'm going away to something. We want to incorporate some send-off into the story. It's always been like, oh, he, he just kind of plays when he wants to, or one friend just kind of ghosted our entire friend group at one point. Uh, so, like, we... In, when we were fucking around in Sandpoint for way too long, we we developed our, we made our own little tavern, and so all of these uh, player characters that were that would come in, in and out would just be at the tavern. We would say if they weren't playing with us, and then if they <laughs> like working at the he's working yeah, his shift at yeah, the tavern. Yeah, he's working at the tavern, <laughs> and if they want to come out and find us, they can come out and find us. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like you know. For me, in that situation, Griffin, that's a different problem. You know, that's a commitment problem that, like, for one, I would have ironed out at session zero. You know, like, I'm not going to run a game that meets every week and there, from the get-go, a player can only make it once every three weeks. Like, then you can't make this game because this game yeah. is a weekly game. Now, we have run games that are bi-weekly or once a month, and that's fine if you set that tone or you set that parameter at the beginning of the game. But like, if you're started this as a weekly game and we're playing weekly and then somebody's just flaking or just, or they come into a situation where they have to work every other Monday, that's a problem, you know? And that's not, you know, it depends on how it came to be. Like if it's real life things and as, you know, job opportunities and you, you I'd be much more willing to work with it. But like, if it's just like, eh, I'm only going to play when I can show up. That's like, well, I, you know, we've had those discussions before in some of the t games we've played and it's, well, it's like, well, this, this is meeting weekly. So you're either cool with that and can do that or you can't, you know, but we're not going to float the middle, you know? Yeah. So I, I actually tend to disagree with you there hmm. and I'll tell you why. Uh, I'm a and it, it's to be honest, it's actually. it's maybe because uh, at least my home games are very much how we socialize on the weekends, mm -hmm. and so I'm not going to penalize somebody that can't hang out every weekend with the well. Hey, that's our social interaction on the weekend, so you can no longer hang out with us on the weekend because you can't make every session. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? And so I find that in my home games, I'm much more flexible with hey. You, you can't make it because you're doing X, Y, or Z. You're hanging out with someone else this weekend. Like, I don't care. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, so that's, I, that. I guess it, it really depends on the kind of game because for, you know, for another example, we have another weekly game that I don't run that uh, we have only ever played without somebody one time. 
and it's a five person party would be doable without that. But because we're much more invested in the story in that one, and it's not like our social interaction for the week, we're not as flexible with somebody missing. So I can see it both ways, but I think it really depends on the kind of game you're running. Yeah. Like I was going to ask, you know, for that weekend game, is that more like a little bit looser as far Absolutely. as, you know, like you, I, I can't imagine that you're putting half the amount of story effort into a game like that. If it's more about just the socializing and like, almost getting together to play video games and stuff like right that, it's like know? it's like we're we're drinking around the table and shooting the shit while we're playing right it, yeah. it's playing modules like fall of plague stone <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the story it's, you know yeah. what i mean hey what do you guys want to do this weekend do you want to do you want to die do you want to roll up three characters? Modules, <laughs> yeah, roll up a bunch funny, of characters and just... It's funny you mentioned that, because Fall of Plague Stone, we played just to test out 2E, and that was a come-if-you-can game. like the But that was, like, set up like that from the get-go. I was like, you know, basically six people made PCs, and I was like, as long as we have, have four that can play, we'll play, you know? Because we were just, as you said, that was just a hangout, and we were also just kind of testing the system trying to get familiar with the system so we weren't as invested in the narrative uh, like fidelity of it all like it didn't matter if i just said oh this person decided to go look at a tree for three hours like that's what they did and it's fine you know so I think I think now I know we were kind of what we're twenty minutes in at this point. I think a good caveat to throw down for this is that every table's different, every game's different, right? You know, like when you're talking about a story focused game, yeah, you want to have something that's cohesive. You have the same people attending when your sessions attend, and yeah, you know that's how you want to do it. If you're throwing together, a, you know, a weekend, you know, screw around with friends, then somebody can't make it. Yeah, I think I think both both are valid. But I think the key comes back to session zero of that game, right? Like, if that's right. what it's going to be out of the gate, that's what it's going to be out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Make sure everybody has that proper expectation going into it. Yeah, but I think this isn't a session zero conversation. This no, is not necessarily. you deal with it when it happens. Yeah, because so. that's true. Because, like, eventually something's going to change from what you, you set at session zero. You know, especially if you're not running a podcast with that extra layer of, like, commitment you know like when you're just playing a game it's much easier for that to fracture so you know speaking of that let's move away from like real life issues pulling you away and talk about some of the other issues that can happen at your table um let's talk about burnout okay um and you know, I think burnout a lot of times gets attributed to GMs, but I think players can burn out too. Um, so I want to talk about it from from both sides. Uh, although we'll, I guess we'll incorporate our player advice piece as we go through these different problems instead of separating it out this week because I think it's easier to do it that way. So, you know, as a GM, how do you deal with burnout? And then how do you deal with player burnout uh i've i mean a year into a podcast especially one that has been covid induced for at least half of it i mean i yeah i've i've felt some some burnout this year just because uh, of the editing and the prepping and just never leaving my house and stuff like that uh, for me i've been able to combat it by knowing that i don't necessarily have to um, I don't know, prepare everything that's going into an episode. So sometimes it's nice to know that set up to just like set up an episode for yourself that, you know, the players are going to handle the, the bulk of the, the talking or just kind of like a, do a bottle episode. Then the, then the characters really need to like figure out their own stuff, talk, then you can listen and figure out what you're going to do next. Maybe they're going to throw some new ideas at you that you can then uh, go in with kind of a, a fresh feeling. I think uh, I think it's a good point to call out what uh, Eric is saying in the chat. How are we defining burnout? Because I think burnout can happen a couple of different ways. Right now, we're talking more about I guess both like player and GM burnout. I guess, but it's yeah. I, I guess, guess my like, thought was just like kind of feeling like it's like actually working towards preparing it is harder 
to physically get yourself to do. I, my mind. I guess for for me, it's um, I'm defining it as that moment when sitting down to play or sitting down to prep or sitting down to GM your players feels more like work than it does fun, you know, and like that you're showing up and having to like go through it, just go through the motions. Right. And that that's kind of how I'm defining burnout in that, you know, especially if you play weekly, even more so if you play multiple games weekly, like the games can be a lot of, it can be very taxing mentally and emotionally, you know, because you get invested in them and certainly mentally because of all the, uh, all the, all the math and organization of information that you have to do in these games, like that you can, you can have this point to where like, if you haven't been enjoying it for, a while because you're not like really into the current thing that's happening then you sitting down and this feels more like work more like a chore you know i mean yeah. let me let me back up and and not say how do you deal with it have you all experienced that before yeah absolutely both as a player and as a gm yeah okay i would say probably when it comes down to something like that it, it you know, there's going to be a lot of depends on your table caveats, right? But uh, who it is, for what reason they're experiencing the ver the burnout. I think one of the most important things to do when table troubles occur in any way, shape, or form is to communicate, communicate, communicate. Mm -hmm. You know, keep those lines of communication open. Uh, you're, you know, I talked about when I pinged everybody in my server earlier about how you're choosing to spend tens, hundreds, thousands possible hours with this group of people, you know, talk to each other. If you don't talk to each other, like any relationship between people, it's going to fall apart if you don't communicate grievances with each other or, or you know, talk about the things that are difficult or, you know, if you're having a hard time in life and you need to s step back, talk to the people about it. I mean, this is a good way to both become closer with friends at your table that you're playing with and a good way to become friends with people who you aren't already friends with if you're playing in like a society table or something you know you say hey i've i've got this feeling about our game this is what i think is happening and you can either talk to one person in particular you can talk to the gm or if you're the GM, talk to the player but i think that's that's going to preface all of my answers coming forward is Communicate, communicate, communicate. Talk, yeah. talk, talk. Yeah, you yeah. have to talk. If you're not talking, yeah. nothing can get resolved. There's like a there's like a chart that floats around Reddit. I see, I you know, used to see all the time. I've seen it less lately, but like somebody will post a a, a thread on Reddit, being like, "Oh man, I, I've I've got this issue at my table. You know, what do I do?" And they'll they'll post a chart, and it's like a flow chart. And the first thing is. Did you talk to them? <laughs> yeah, here it is. There, old, there you go. Scratch Somebody posted it in the, the chat for you. Like, oh, yeah. oh, good old Scratch. <laughs> yeah, nice. I mean, that's the first thing is talk to them about it like an adult. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, and if and, and you'd be surprised how many people are like, oh, well, I haven't done that yet. You know, and it's like, well, that's the start. You know, that's the start. And I and, think inspiration brian for the quick drop on that <laughs> yeah that wait hold on really you, like, you have that saved in a folder somewhere are you prepping that for tonight Is that what happened? Yeah. <laughs> seems like, i don't know we'll see he knew it was his time to shine yeah. with yeah. that <laughs> i've been waiting to drop this for so long <laughs> i think personally the way my group avoids burnout is by having multiple game masters i think that really helps because we will uh, we'll rotate what that weekend game is. Sometimes somebody will run a one shot. Sometimes you just need something to freshen it up, a new character to play or a new setting to help your burnout issues. Sometimes your burnout is because, hey, we've been stuck in X for five sessions and I'm just getting tired of X. I'm just getting tired of fighting fire giants. I want to do something else. <laughs> I want to do something else. 
like let me do something else and and so sometimes that one or two session just quick injection of somebody else running a game a different game mastery style different characters getting to role play with different you know with different characters and play with different abilities sometimes that's all the injection you need to go back to your main game and feel good about where you are instead of it's feeling like coming right. home yeah I yeah, it's like coming. Exactly. That's a good point. It's that's exactly point. what it yeah. is, though. Yeah, and and that's why I'm a huge proponent of modules. That's why I'm so excited. Starfinder is getting a module, and that mm. there are so many good modules for one e and two e. Is that modules are like a really good, even even just society scenarios, really, but they're a really good injection of something that is pre-written that anyone at your group could GM, and that can give you a different a change of scenery that you need. I mean, I can't tell you how many times it's like a breath of fresh air when somebody else GMs something, and I can just yeah, chill. Step I'm sure. Back. I'm sure you guys feel that too. It's like, yeah. uh, oh god, I get to play. I get to play Starfinder. That's new, right? You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, right? the, but like the lunch hour heroes has been my saving grace in in that regard. Dude, that's been so much fun. Shout out to Jason fun. for running yeah. that. He's running us through the beginner box <laughs> in oh, second wow. edition, I bet that's uh, and we. Fun. Our group is our group is three it's, monks, a cleric, and a bard. Is that right? Uh, one monk got changed into a cleric. Yes, got changed into. Well, he 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 decided to switch it up into and be a cleric. Instead okay. Of, uh, when we all realized we came to the table with monks, <laughs> yeah, three monks and a bard showed up. Oh, and a druid. Three monks, a bard, and a druid, and then yep. another druid showed up, and then our <laughs> our uh, our yeah our monk switched to a cleric. Yeah. So it, it, I mean, that's been a really good time, but yeah, I agree with you that that's just really fun to, especially like your level one, you could just kind of relax in that. And mm -hmm. we shot some rats right away. That was, that was easy. <laughs> so, so having like that, 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 you know, side game is, it's a really good idea, uh, yeah. depending on the type of group that you're playing with, because I think everyone's tables a little bit different to converse what or to go a little bit opposite of what you guys do about talking about small injections uh my group in the past has had a tendency to flip-flop to another adventure path either with the same gm or a different gm just because oh this story arc is getting slow right now and we've been looking at this other ap that just came out let's go play that right uh most of the time we handled burnout as a table collectively by hopping from mm -hmm. one campaign to the next. Did you ever go back to those campaigns that you had burnt out on? Yeah, yeah. It all it 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 frequently happened where we would go back and finish. Yes. Cool. Uh, depending on the amount of interest, how much people enjoyed the characters they were playing there, and you know, sometimes taking a step back from that game, if you've got multiple people who are like, "Yeah, I don't really want to do this anymore," when you give them the chance to take that step back, put time between the last time they played that character and look at it they might think oh i just didn't like playing this character when you go back to it you write somebody else in sometimes that's the answer for players is you don't like the character you've created it happens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know but sometimes you don't realize it right away so so the general advice then for players and gms that y'all are saying is to is to talk to the other and kind of voice that there's burnout and figure out a way to to liven up the game session itself whether it's a different game or it's a module side game or if it's just bringing in a new character it's figuring out the root cause of what's causing the burnout yeah um either taking a break or changing things up i think that you know i agree with all that i think sometimes burnout comes from just being stressed in real life for sure and that <laughs> yep. it's it might be worthy of saying hey let's just take this week off, you know, like th there's nothing wrong with taking some time. If that's what it is, you know, like if it's, you're just not in the headspace to run a game or you're just not in the headspace to role play your character. And you know, we're going into a big role play situation. Let's say, okay, you know, Hey man, I, I hear you. You had a rough, couple days this is what you know this isn't the the space to experience that if you haven't decompressed from that in your own way so let's just take a 
take a quick break. You know what I mean? And if that, that requires a lot of trust among the group to say, yeah, we're going to come back and that we're not going to always take a break every time somebody is feeling bad. But, you know, if it's worth taking a break for the benefit of the mental health of the people at your table, then you should do that, you know? Yeah. And that should be part of the options on the table. I really like that you brought that up because I'm going to take this to the, to the podcast realm, which we often do, Mm -hmm. uh, and say that, one thing that really helped me avoid burnout is doing exactly that. I noticed that we used to record every Thursday. We used to record every Thursday and we would record the next episode the Thursday that the current episode dropped. Uh-huh. Unless, you know, unless we were banking for like a holiday or something. And then COVID hit and we banked 10 episodes. Like we we banked 10 episodes before the virus hit and everything. And before we were quarantined at home, which kind of let us ride that a little bit. But what it also did was let me say, you know, okay, let's, let's bank it. Let's start banking episodes now so that I can, I can say one week, guys, I don't really feel like playing, or I can just do our normal every Thursday schedule if I'm still feeling good. But we have the capacity now as a podcast to say, oh no, we got, we got a couple weeks in the hopper. Let's just, you know, you don't feel like GMing it this week. That's fine. Mm-hmm. I think and that's, that's necessary. That you know? Yeah. And you like hate to say that you burn out on, uh, <laughs> on our podcast yeah. shows, but it happens. It yeah, definitely it has happens. Nothing, it has nothing to do. Oftentimes burnout has nothing to do with the players or the game or the story or what, you know, it's just a, a being tired with your mental space. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And especially in a year like 2020, and I hate to break it to you guys, but 2021 is going to be worse. Uh, uh, but 20, what? 20, what are you 20, doing? 20, that's a tease, by the way. <laughs> what a teaser. 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 Who knows what happens? Uh, uh, Hashtag GMTs. <laughs> but no, like, you know, the thing is, is that like sometimes you're just not in the space to do it, you know? And like you need to be able to say, I, I can't do this tonight because i've got other things going through my brain that would just this wouldn't be fun for anybody because i'm not gonna be in it you know yeah Um, when i when i'm burning out i just start procrastinating even worse than i normally do oh yeah baby (laughs) yep here and there i i have definitely been like guys i um, haven't been the bet i haven't been on my my game this week I haven't edited the episode. We have one banked up. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna cancel our usual Sunday thing. We can either try and do it later in the week, uh, or just skip this one and it's all good. Yeah, I mean, even outside of the podcast realm, that's perfectly fine to do. You know, yeah. I mean, obviously, there's more of a consequence when we do it. That's a different story. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah, you know, we're talking serious. about you know people playing at home. That's perfectly fine, and you know. I was going to bring this up a little bit earlier, and I think this is a good way to, to take it. Um, I, I don't think we can necessarily say that all table troubles stem from burnout, and I think we've been mm. on burnout for a while, right? But yeah, my, my, yeah. to kind of – I have something to put in for it. Sometimes it's not burnout. Sometimes there's something really going wrong in somebody's life, right? And when you're spending hours of a month with somebody and you if you if you have any sort of indication or sense that somebody's home life or real life is going really, really poorly, right? And this is GM advice. Uh, maybe talk with them on a person to person level first to see if, hey, you know, I have a fun idea to give you a break and go handle your shit on your own time when you need to do it. And we'll we'll write you out. And then you come in when you feel comfortable coming in. And when you come back, we'll make it a party when you come back, right? right. Like this will be your injection of endorphins, right? Like we'll write you out and, you know, maybe your character's being pulled out of the material plane and into the shadow plane at random times. So when you come yeah. back, it's a big deal. It's all about you, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, right. you hide outside the window and yeah. break in. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, <laughs> there's so many different ways that you can actually, we can help each other as people through this game too. You know, but sometimes we're not we're not willing to tell either a group of folks that we don't necessarily know very well or even some of our closest friends. We have a hard time talking about those sorts of things. Um, And, you know, again, going back to communication, if you see it as a GM, if you see it in another player, maybe just reach out and say, hey, is everything okay at home? Is everything okay in your life? 
Um, mm-hmm. How can we make that better during the free time that you have that you've dedicated to this group? You know, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying so when every that... table's a, a, a therapy session, right? Uh, right. Uh, when does that become fun. not the GM's re- responsibility? I totally get doing that, especially in a group of close friends. Close friends. Like, you, you want your friends, <laughs> you want your friends' lives to be going well. Yeah. Right. But um, imagine you're maybe not as close at the table. When is, where's the line between prying into somebody you maybe don't know so well's life and actually saying, hey, man, like, you don't seem like you're having a good time. I don't know if this is really for you. Well, I think that brings us to another problem that happens at the table, which is the breaking of the social contract that that is inherent in agreeing to play at a table that like that's meeting regularly. So there's a difference between society play like with society play, you're making the decision to go spend four hours with strangers playing the game. So you better come wanting to play if sure. you're in the headspace to play it. Don't why, why do you I doubt that you'll be there, right? social contract is more applicable to like the long-term games and so the line is 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 your internal struggle being manifested in a way that's toxic or dangerous to the other people at the table you know are you affecting the other people's mental health at the table then you then the tone of the GM's responsibility changes a little bit. And it's like, Hey, look, you know, we're all here to play a game. And for the last three weeks, you've come with a lot of like negative energy, you know, and you've just been like shitting on every, everybody's fun, you know, and those are hard conversations. I'm having a hard time just like saying it as a hypothetical, but like, those are hard conversations that you have to have sometimes if it's like getting to that level where everybody else at the table is feeling uncomfortable and not having a good time because one person is not processing their own internal shit, you know, and, and how much of that is the GM's responsibility? It's how much do you want to keep the game going? You know, like if I think, I think we're talking about the difference between strangers and friends. No, well, not really. Maybe because I think at this, I'm t- so I'm taking like society play out of the equation here. Okay, that's like a yeah. single instance. You know, sure. I'm talking about uh, now. You might start a game with strangers. You meet some people online through an LFG t- type situation, but you get six weeks into it. Okay, you've been playing with these same people now for six weeks, right? So. Yeah. I, a GM has to decide if they're willing to have that hard conversation with one player to, to save the table in that game or say this, I'm sorry, this game's over. I'll take these three people that are having a good time and we'll start a new one. I don't know. I, my, my take and how I approach it for better or worse is I'm going to get in that person's face and talk to them about it. I'm going to make them talk to me about what the shit's going on. Cause that's just who I am, you know, sure. like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I would say that that's the advice I give to all of you listening, uh, <laughs> I, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know if that's the best way to handle it, but that is certainly how I handle it. And, and I would say, look, you have to decide if you want to come along with the other four people here at this table or not, you know, but if you do want to keep coming here each week to play, these are some some just like basics that you're going to have to hit. It's going to start with you not shitting on the fighter who just started learning this game, not knowing what they can do. Like you need to chill out or you need to stop flirting with this character's player because you're making them uncomfortable or you need to stop questioning every single rules choice that I make because this is just how I'm running the game. You know, like, all those different types of toxic behaviors, if you don't talk about them and you keep pressing on, leaving them unchecked, they just get bigger and manifest bigger problems. Yeah, I mean, if you're toxic at my table, you better be my best friend or I'm just gonna cut you from the table. 
yeah uh, where you where you have the conversation adam like if you're one of my really good friends and you're pissing me and everybody off at the table i will have a conversation with you but i think this gets back to what we were talking about a little bit where it's like how close are you with those people at the table if you're like uh someone's boyfriend that they brought to come play and you're pissing everybody off at the table i'm going to talk to the person that brought you and be like hey listen this is kind of ruining it so we can have a talk and you can talk to them but they are not my problem and if they continue this i'm just gonna say no I'm just right. going <laughs> to, I'm not going to sacrifice my game for this one person. Maybe that makes me selfish, but by the same token, don't disrespect me as a GM at my own table that I'm putting all this effort into. There, in, in, there's a two way street. You come to my table and I understand that shit goes on at home, but there's a level of like respect you need to have for coming to play. Right. Too. That's the social and contract. So, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the social contract. And so like, by making a muck at the table, by making people feel crappy and by not listening the first time you're told that is then disrespect at my table. And that's where I start to get offended. Yeah. So you say the first time you're told that's that conversation that I'm talking about. Exactly. Having, right. I will have it and I'm a little like, I'm going to lay it all out, you know, but if you continue to, to do the same behavior, after we've discussed it or if you're like man fuck you i just this is how i play it's just how i made my character yeah i'm gonna, I'm gonna mama bear here. for my good players yeah, yeah, hard yeah, i will yeah, mama bear like, for my good players all right so we'll see you you know yeah. <laughs> like you're out you're and I, I i'm totally in agreement with you you know you have a responsibility as a gm and i see some chat or some chatter in the chat about it's the player's responsibility too. But the player, if they're letting you know that this person over here is ruining their experience and you have three players telling you that they've done their responsibility, they've communicated to you and said, you know, this is, this is not fun. This person is making me uncomfortable. This person is, is causing this to not be a cool thing. Then it's like, well, look, man, <laughs> Here's the situation, you know? I think I think that goes in two directions, though. I think it's not always the GM that's going to be, like, the person that's okay with confrontational stuff. So, yes, the first step for any player should be go to the GM, let it be known that this stuff's happening. But also, like, if there is a player at the table that's more comfortable with doing having those kind of conversations in the GM, I feel like it's okay that that player has the conversation at least with the GM. I feel like there's a fine line between ganging up on somebody and not, but I mean, not every GM out there is going to be comfortable with sitting someone down and, and having the hard conversation, yeah, having the Their talk conflicts. Yeah, exactly. It, not, it, that doesn't mean you can't be a good GM by the way, right? You can, but if you have a player that's better at that, a player can certainly go up to that other player and be like, hey, I'm speaking for the rest of the table when I say this is the kind of stuff that's going wrong. That can also be a player's role. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really to the strengths of the people at the table, right? You know, and wherever that may be. And, and I do think you bring up a good point. I don't think it's ever a good idea to create a situation where there's four people attacking one person. No, that's never a good idea. Like, it should be a one on one conversation, regardless of who's having that conversation, because if you want somebody to if you want to guarantee that somebody's going to go on to an aggressive defense, that's a good way yeah. to do it. Yeah. The only well, way I say that it, it wouldn't be one on one is if it's the player initiating the conversation with the other player, in which case the GM, even moderate, if you're not yeah. even if you're not going to be the person that's sure. having the talk, the GM sometimes needs to be involved there, because a lot of times that player will be like, well, you're just another player and Griffith will let me do this. It's, right. And then I'll be like, yeah, well, you know, you know somebody still kind of shit. <laughs> in the chat. Let's see if I can find who asked here. But um, yeah, so Jason Laptop, I, he, I'm not going to call you Jason Kringle because <laughs> you'll always, always be J Laptop to me. But um, <laughs> he, he, he was talking about, right, you know, as the GM, are they always given the mantle of default mediator? I kind of think, yes, to some degree, if you're the GM of the table, you are the mediator of the table. Now, 
to Griffin's point, you don't have to be the one that does the talking, you know, necessarily, or the one that brings the issue to the forefront, but you are the, the leader of the table. You're the you know? arbiter. You set your game, table's yeah. atmosphere. You set yeah. your social contract for that table and what's acceptable. And so you are kind of, whether you're having the conversation or not, the final say right. on, on yeah. what is said there. You'll be looked to as the referee and more than exactly. just common. I mean, we all like yeah. to say, oh, well, the players can have just as much responsibility as the GM. I'm going to hashtag player call out. No, they fucking don't. Not really. You know I mean? <laughs> they don't. You know, like, it's just the truth. You know, if you're the GM, you're arbitrating the game, the purpose that you're at the table. So, therefore, you're going to naturally be arbitrating any issues that around it period you know yeah you can get assistance or even players can lead conversations but your input is going to be crucial to all any discussion about the table you know you know and depending on if anybody's listened to our session zero conversation uh i know we brought up back then uh the red x card to yeah. lay out the the use of the x card during session zero you know one way that we can have uh, you know, players communicate to each other in game that they're uncomfortable with something, just throw up that red X card. You know, if player A says something to player B and player B don't like it, throw up the X card. And if you as a GM are seeing a player interaction causing a lot of X cards to be thrown up, I mean, you don't need cards to indicate that a lot of times if you're good at reading social situations. And I feel like a lot of GMs are. It's kind of how we get to where we are right at a table. Um, that you can see those red cards going up as they occur. If you see that sort of thing happening, it's not a bad thing to be preemptive either. Just say, hey, it looks like, you know, so-and-so is uncomfortable with this type of interaction that you're having with your character. Uh, are you, how married to you are to, to this character trait? Or would you be willing to rethink it because you're, for lack of a better word, triggering another player to, at, at the table, right? I got to say, one of my pet peeves is like, doing problematic behavior and then hand waving away. Well, that's just what my character would do. Yeah. Well, don't make a fucking character. That's a piece of shit that you got to play yeah. with four other people. You know what I mean? Like that's just, why would you make that character? Yeah. yeah. You Back know, to session like, zero on that one. Yeah. 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 Like, Oh, I'll make a character that doesn't trust anyone. And I mean, anyone. And so like the whole, like the whole anyone. time is like, no, no. Oh, well he said, we're going this way. No, I don't believe him. You know, like just, just, being a stalwart for nothing you know mm -hmm. that's that's not enough that's not a good character yeah and you, <laughs> you know like no. that's a shitty character it's a shitty character like and nobody likes those... playing with that character i agree but in like a in like a story arc perspective if you come to the table with an asshole character be ready to have that character change and evolve as everybody's like, you're a shitty person. Stop being a shitty person. Yeah. You can have character a gets better, you know? <laughs> yeah, I agree. Alfoy's you can almost redeemable by the end of the series. You can be too. Yeah. You can have a flawed character without a doubt, you know, but if one of the traits of your character on a meta level causes conflict with the, with the game and, mm -hmm. and the players, like, you know, oh, I'm just playing a racist. Well, dude, like, that's not really going to be cool at this that? table. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> or sorry. most tables. Sorry. Okay. No, and, and this <laughs> is really, <laughs> it's funny you bring that up. I actually had one of my, one of my tables had a, a, a situation very similar to that where um, one player was playing a goblin and another player was playing a goblin hating halfling. And we had the conversation during session zero that, hey, this character is going to hate the other character. We got to be okay with that before we move forward, right? Like, is everybody cool with this? Are the two players cool with it? They started off cool with it. And then after that player was in character calling out the other player session after session, they're like, well, shit, is this in character? Or are you just, are you just being an asshole to me, right? Right, right. We had to reassess that situation. And we had to be like, yo, man, you either have to make this character development that you told us about in session zero happen now because it's making them uncomfortable or you got to drop that trait. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was a problem. Um, okay. Well, we are about six minutes from the hour mark. Nice. And, you know, 
I think there's lots of other specific problems that can come up, but I'd like to hear from the listeners about some of those. And we'll talk as a group to some of the, the issues that you all have, but I want to just kind of ask you before we go off, you know, what, are there any problems that happen at a table that you, that are specific to podcasting? Yeah. Let's talk about that for just a moment. So I think um, the biggest problems with a podcasting group are issues that interrupt the flow of the game. They're not necessarily problems that you would even really call out a player at your home games table with. But when you've been, when there's something that consistently interrupts the flow because it takes so much for everybody to get into their characters and to get that really good role play happening, uh, that's a no, no. Like when that happens, it, it can grind the rest of the team to a halt and it can screw up a recording session, honestly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or it can screw up the vibe of 15 minutes of something that creates half of a show that is not interesting to listen to. And that sucks. And that's something that needs to be addressed if your group is a podcast. Mm -hmm. um, for us specifically, uh, we have kind of a style guide that we follow. Um, for us, if it's if we're bullshitting, if we're rules look up, or if we're playing the game, those things are okay which I know that's, those are three pretty broad fucking categories. Right. But it's all that those are all things that we do on a normal game night to have fun. And if we're not doing that to have fun, like we don't bring, we don't bring politics into game night. We shut that shit down quick because that disrupts the style of the night. Um, and that's something that's, yeah. Like Griff, like you said, do you interrupt what your flow is for your cast? You got to shut that down because people have expectations when they're listening. You know? It's very interesting too, because like you guys have a brand and you guys have a brand and you guys have a brand and we have a brand like everybody, when, when you have a podcast that's been out for a little bit, you have a brand, mm -hmm. whether mm -hmm. you play to it or not, there's a brand that exists. Like, and I'll be honest for a podcast game. I feel like you kind of got to play on brand at least mm -hmm. with, whatever your brand may be, you know, you guys got to look up the rule if, you know, if you're unsure about it, right? Because you are the rules based podcast. So you got to yeah. figure it out before that session's over. You got to call out the correct rule yep. and move on from there. Right. I mean, like we're cracking brewskis at the start of ours. We are the actual drinking podcast. Mm -hmm. Like it's just a, it's just a part of the game. Like a part of the game is going to be asking what everybody's drinking. Don't, don't leave me hanging right. on that, right? right. Don't not have you a know. drink. Come on. There, there's yeah, there's just there's just a brand piece of it that's kind of interesting when you think about actual play podcasts too. Yeah, I mean, so f for us, I mean, it goes back to the the burnout or or rather I think more accurately like the right headspace um because and that, that happens in twofold. One with our intros that we do, you know, sometimes it's somebody's turn to do the intro and they just have nothing for that week and they've had a shit week and they, and they don't want to do it, you know, and, but like they got to do it. Cause as you said, it's part of a brand, you know, that's a problem that comes up. And then another problem that comes up is like, we like to bullshit a little bit at the beginning of all of our episodes to kind of like get into the, into the vibe. And if anybody's, in a bad headspace, that's that whole dynamic is going to be fucked. You know what I mean? And it's, it's going to, it's, it's going to feel forced, you know? And so the way we handle the intros is if somebody really just has nothing and just can't feel it, we'll hand it off to one of the other players. We kind of lean on each other for that, you know? And then for the intros, like if somebody's visibly upset, we aren't going to hit record until we, talk about it and there's been times that we have not recorded an episode a night that we were planning on recording and spent all that time having a, a talk session to sort shit out you know but when you're on a schedule you can't have a lot of those nights <laughs> right <laughs> you know, like, i mean you're right 
<laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta record more than you talk. You know, yeah. you gotta record yourself talking more than you record yourself not or not record yourself talking. Whatever. Uh, Allard, what 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 issues do you run to, into as a podcaster at your table? I was trying to think of that while you guys were talking. I mean the the main thing I think was hit on by Griff for me is just like interrupting flow. I think we've I think uh, at the mo- uh, for the most part we did a good job at creating the social con- contract that we were going to not just talk about random bullshit in the middle of when we're playing and and like don't be on your phones and stuff like that. Uh, I think if we wouldn't have done that, then I would have had more uh, more issues to talk about right now. Uh, but no, nope, people don't use their phones. Uh, if I am like looking up something or something, then they can bullshit around a little bit more. Um, but it's been pretty pretty good as far as like not having too many issues. Uh, I think the yeah, I I don't have much to talk on right now i've i'm pretty happy with my players at the moment i guess table's perfect no complaints yeah, it's pre- the, the nice <laughs> sorry crisis. we don't have any of those issues yeah. it's the <laughs> nice crisis not the have. table crisis <laughs> <laughs> damn gotcha. dropping it like usual yeah. okay, the hero <laughs> point allard man yeah, always yeah. Got thank, those you. thank you thank you <laughs> but, um, i think as long as as long as we're all just like sitting down and we're on the same page at what we're trying to get across, I think things have been things have been smooth sailing in in that regard. And well, yeah, I, I think that it it shouldn't go without saying that all of us took our table to a podcast because we're all very lucky to have the tables that we have. You know, oh, we're yeah. talking a lot about table problems here. We've had them in our past and stuff, but like. I don't think any of us would have started a podcast with the people that we started our podcast with if we weren't a hundred percent trusting those people at the table and, and knowing that we're on the same page. So I, I want to give a positive player call out yeah. to all the players of all the FFS collective for being awesome players. Cause we do value the shit out of y'all. Hell yeah. You know how lucky we are to have you. you Absolutely. Know? Well, and I think everything we talked about here, like everything we talked about that's an issue for a podcast would probably never be a a, a huge issue at a normal table. It's because it's like it's at a it's at a higher level at that point because it's recorded and everything. Yeah, I I would never call out a player for like disrupting the flow while we're all eight beers deep at my home game on the weekend. (laughs) How dare you? (laughs) Well, I think, I think with that, we're going to take a short break and we'll come back and do some listener questions. Um, So y'all, if you got any particular situations that have come up at your tables, shoot them at us. We'll, we'll talk about them. We got some good questions already and we'll see you in about 10 minutes. We'll call it seven 45. We'll be back. See ya. Hello, welcome back to the second half of <clears throat> this month's GM Happy Hour. In the break, Allard and I were talking a little bit, and Allard, you had something you wanted to add before we got into listener questions. Yes, just on your last question about like just like the little troubles that I've had in in my podcast. And I want to flip it and say when I was a player before our podcast, I had issue just kind of with the amount of dedication or paying attention that was going on at the table. And I remedied that by starting a podcast. So any of you, any of you out there who are <laughs> unhappy really got with them. your table, <laughs> you really got, got them. them. Start a podcast. I'm telling hey, you, everyone. Just start a podcast. <laughs> if you don't get what you're doing, you're going to look like a fool because I'm yeah. recording this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was, uh, I was telling Allard that I was like, yeah, you can just hold them much more responsible when you're putting it out there for the whole world to hear, you know? Yeah, everyone can hear how stupid you're being. Yeah, <laughs> like they're going to tell you what a dick you're being right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a, just a little bit like that. Oh, That's man. That's much all I had to say. It, that backfired because now everybody <laughs> just tells me what a dick I am. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I feel that. Pretty much. Everyone thinks I'm evil now. I don't get it. I know. Like, I got this weird reputation of being an asshole. See, uh, right. That, that's the, the, you have to revel in it, Adam. That's the trick. Oh, mm-hmm. I got this weird reputation trick. of being kind. 
weird. Yeah, that's not that me at all. Weird. You're always the <laughs> kind yeah, GM out here. Yeah, that's so weird because I don't think that that's true. It's not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag GM call out. GM call out. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe a little GM call oh, out there. Um, Good way to start off the second half. Yeah, well, let's get to the listener questions, and we're going to start Sweet. with Pickle with a Z, otherwise known as Zickle, oh, the Zickle. sentient Pickle, J Pickle. <laughs> um, he asked a question, what are some common culprits that have caused your players to become disinterested? And the follow-up to that is, what have you done in those situations to bring your players back around? So that's something we didn't really talk about at the top, is players not being toxic, players not having real life issues getting in the way they're just not interested in what you're doing and, and i think griff you talked to, about it uh, for a little bit but let's talk specifically about that what do we do there <laughs> this might yeah, be yeah. another call out um i find that that often happens with whatever subsystem paisa has put into their adventure path if oh you're playing one yeah uh happened to us a couple times uh I recommend just taking it out if that's the case. Yep. I ran yeah. into that with the Jade Regent caravan setting or the mm -hmm. caravan rules. It's just a lot of time it's like a resource management thing or something weird that not everybody's into and you'd have to have a pretty specific group of people to actually be interested in it. Yeah, gotcha. That happens a lot, but I think it also happens a lot when you just have a lack of variety in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're You're in a dungeon crawl and you've been in a dungeon crawl for five sessions now and the enemies aren't very varied games. or interesting or you're <laughs> i mean shit the amount of times i could say i probably burnt my players out on being kind of like grim dark is uh <laughs> you know <laughs> like i mean imagine oh you can't heal because like you're in a fucking haunted place it's just gonna come after you every night you try and do cool like yeah, I, I get that that burns people out. Right. It definitely does. The The remedy to that is, like, give them a safe room. Uh, but but I think a lot, of, a lot of times you run into, you have different players at the table, and people will get burnt out if you do a bunch of role-playing sessions, too, and they're not, your role, they're not your star role player, or they're even just playing, like, the Barbarian or something. That's burnout. That's boring. For me, there's a distinction between GM burnout and player burnout. And my player burnout is when I get bored. I get bored and that's that does it for me. That's that's what makes me want to stop as a player. As a GM, it's stress for me. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of the burnout that your players come to the table with is that they're bored with what you've been doing. Your enemies are too common. Your, your sessions are too uniform. You got to mix it up. If send one of them to Abaddon or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> spice it up. Or Introduce spice it, Add a little bit of spice to it. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's a GM and player call out there. Like, Haley, he did you dirty there, but what you going to do, you know? What you going to do? Oh, um, man. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, that definitely happens. That's That happened for us when we were doing Tomb of Annihilation, and there's like a big hex crawl portion of that, and it's just like go to this hex, roll random weather encounters, roll random jungle encounters, right? You know, like everything was so randomized and like the, the, the failure conditions were that you got lost and you had to do it again. You had to <laughs> add more to this if you got lost. And like, I think that appeals to a certain kind of player. It certainly did not appeal to our table at all. And so what I did was, you know, to answer the second part of your question, Jay Pickle, is that I stopped doing it. Like if once I realized that every person at my table did not like the hex crawl exploration mechanics that were happening, I stopped, I paused the game. I said, y'all give me two weeks. And I wrote or plan, I didn't write, write, but I planned all the random encounters so that they had like a little bit of thread and that, we didn't have to waste 20 minutes for every hex of saying, okay, this is what the weather's like. And because of this, this is the conditions you have to deal with. And then here's a random alligator fight. And then here's a random velociraptor fight. And then here's like a bat fight after you yeah. fight veloc velociraptors. Like who wants to do that? Nobody yeah. wants to do that. 
you know, I mean, you can only shoot yourself in the foot so many times before you realize that's why you can't walk. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, that's what's going on there. You're, you're, if you, if you continue to try and press on with something that's clearly not working, don't be surprised when your game falls apart. Yeah. That's well, the definition of insanity. Right. And I, and I wouldn't say that that is to say, um, you know, always cut those mechanics out. Sometimes your table likes them, right? Like, no, if, yeah, it's Adam says if it's to a certain type of player for the hex, yeah. hex crawl mechanics. I know people who fucking love hex crawls, right? right? And there's ways you can like tweak it. it, right? I thought that you, they you could would tweak like it. it. Yeah, you, know? you could tweak it. it. But what I'm saying is, if your whole table's like, hey, this sucks. Oh yeah, hack it. <laughs> Stop doing hack it. it. Stop Give it a try. Doing it. But yeah. hack it if it's if yeah. it fails. <laughs> If they tell you they don't want to play because they have to roll another, is it storming check? <laughs> cut, cut it out. <laughs> cut it out. Oh, man. And now you no longer get to roll for it. I just pick. Right. Well, they, they <laughs> felt that real hard. You know, but... <laughs> All right. Fine. What's more dramatically appropriate? Right, right, right. Uh, uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You, made, you made my barometer based character completely irrelevant, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I, I built this whole thing to be able to predict the unpredictable weather. What the shit? Uh, all right. All right. So. <clears throat> what was the question? Ne next question. Okay, good. Because I forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, I do have one tiny thing to add to this. Okay. Don't continue to be an antagonist. I know a lot of people are like, oh, antagonistic GMing is like sometimes give your players a little because that's a lot of burnout at the table, too is if you're consistently like so hard on them, eventually people break under that kind of pressure mm -hmm. and don't enjoy it. I know that sounds like weird advice coming from me, but it is something that you should consider. Mm -hmm. Be nice sometimes, and that'll let help. Them, let yeah. them have like a moment of enjoying the power that they have. You yeah, if you're the mean? kind of GM that just like throws hard, 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 hard encounters, that's going to burn people out. Sometimes you need an easy win, or sometimes you you need to be able to think of a crazy solution and have it play out and work. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Having, you can't just that feeling of success, like mm -hmm. that was brought on by the player and not manufactured by the GM really helps bring new life to a person. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Right. I like, no, I like that for a second. I thought I was getting GM called out for, from Griff, but, um, well, oh, no, 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 I was, I was calling myself out a little bit on that. To, Tyler. We haven't you had the, how you want. We haven't had the, the, the antagonistic GM topic yet. I know it's on our list. Um, so I don't want to dive into do it too much, but no, yeah. If they have a creative solution, that's, that's fucking great. That's a great way to inject fun at the table, you know, just like knowing a language that the monster knows and trying to talk to it when it's, you know, an uncommon language that, you know, a normal party shouldn't be taking the time to talk to this thing and they appeal to its sensibilities sure give them a win it's fun yeah yeah i mean players are playing the game to feel like badasses you know what i mean mm -hmm. like now you want them to earn that badassery yes for sure otherwise it feels hollow but sometimes you just got to give them a fight that they can stomp and they can be like Oh man, I'm dropping this fireball and I just wiped out like yeah. 10 kobolds in one drop. Just, pfft. you know, you want to feel yeah. like you're a badass so that the next time you go up against a threatening fight, you realize how threatening they are, you know? Yeah. I think those kind of fights are fun to throw in like right after a level up just so they can just, oh, like, yeah. Oh, stop. Like, yeah. That's <laughs> the best time to do it. It's like, let Some them just. Cockroaches. I'm just going to throw a fireball on them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> um, so here we go. Next question. This one comes from Jason Laptop. What's up? The most common problem I've come across is players unwilling to compromise their fun. One player really likes doing A, but the other player prefers B. My experience is that a compromise, let's call that C, is oftentimes taken as a concession rather than a compromise. So the question here is how do you handle situations like this in your games? And I think that brings up a really good point. Sometimes compromise ends up resulting in both players not having fun, Fair. you know, and that's a good question and a hard question. It is very hard. And, oh, and, 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 and Jay laptop, you're not even listening, but you'll catch this on the, on the VOD. But what do we, what do you do in that situation when you can't please either one? I think you don't make the compromise C. Mm -hmm. I think if it's a situation where two players like doing different things, you let player A have their fun this time, you let player B have their fun the next time. 
it doesn't necessarily have to be like an every other that someone's having fun, but you at least let one have like, it's not a compromise. Let one do their thing and let the other do their thing in a separate instance. I don't think like, I think you got to level with your players. Like you're not always going to be able to do your most fun thing that you always want to do every time. Maybe that's a concession, but the other concession should be that, Hey, I'm, I'm still going to let you do your really fun thing. It's it's kind of what we've talked about several times on this show that as a GM, you want to give your players time to shine in the things that they're really good at. And so I, I, I rarely think the situation should be, we pick C because it's a middle ground between a and B. I think it should yeah, most I, of the time be a or B I agree and with next that. time it's B. I mean, to, to use an example from our show it, with, with the Galta situation and mild spoilers here, but his character got chosen to be the prisoner stand in. And so he, his character is an armor storm character and he was stripped of his armor for, you know, 12 episodes <laughs> a while, show, you know what I mean? Like, a little more than a let player A do something. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's more like, I'm not going to let player B do this. But yeah. uh, no, but no, like they, the, the group had come up with a plan that they were going to fake, they were going to use, do the old, you know, Wookiee trick, right? Where fake that they were, had captured this vest and they were bringing them to the prison. And, and that was tough for Heath, you know, that was really tough for him. In, in the sense that like everything that made his character cool was stripped from him as we went into the main dungeon of book two, you know, right, but and you did a great job then of giving him like six episodes of boxing, right? Right. Well, so, that's how <laughs> there you go. It. So <laughs> that's, how I, gambled, that's, that's right? how I answered it. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, yeah. dude, come through this and I will, I promise you will have your time to shine, you know? And like, mm -hmm. that's what you got to do. Sometimes you got to delay a for B so you don't have to do C because C is not super fun most of the time. Yeah. yeah. You know, unless now, you got that third player that loves C and then baby, you did get, get in <laughs> it. Uh, <laughs> C, you know? um, my favorite letter. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think my advice would be both. Pl I, I have a player answer and the GM answer for, for players. Um, give each other the spotlight. It's so much fun. Give yes, the people at your table the chance to shine. Like you made a character to shine, right? But if you make it a habit of giving the spotlight to your fellow table mates, they will return the favor, right? And you'll be everybody's favorite person at the table oh, too. Oh, absolutely, 100%. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to just be the cleric. You can find fun and creative ways to push the spotlight onto different party members. Uh for the GM advice on that one, yeah, let player A do cool thing. Let player B do cool thing. Forget C, because C, like even the question indicates, is almost never the best answer. Um, unless players A, player A's fun is squashing player player B yeah. in some way. If that's somehow what's happening at your table, there's a really good chance that you need to get out your your player axe and start axing people from your table. Right? That's a different. That's have a that. different conversation. Yeah. That's or you got to figure story. out like have why that, or, that is a thing. Yeah. Or like, why? Why is that a can. thing? Like, how mechanically could that possibly be a thing where you, your only fun would be squashing <laughs> something? The uh, yeah. okay, you're the edgy rogue. I get it. All right. Well, why do you keep stealing that in the from butt. this guy? Yeah, yeah, stop think... stealing from the paladin, man. He's, he's doing his best. <laughs> yeah, like, in dude, my chill. example for this question, when player A wanted to do something, player B wanted to do something else. I in the it hasn't come up as much recently, but I let them split the party. I and love that. Then I let them find out what happens when they go out and do their stuff. And sometimes it was really fun, and sometimes they realized that maybe they shouldn't have this kind of going out on their own thing wasn't the best and they needed yeah, to they shouldn't have died on that hill like, oh, sometimes right. playing both yeah. sides has consequences <laughs> it does. Oh, I think it's, it's I, definitely you always hear don't split the party but sometimes you just have to have people go in different directions and see what happens well sometimes players have to learn the hard way That's you right. know right. Uh -huh. they have to learn that you know and i think sometimes the split 
if you can get if you can get two player A's and two player B's, that's where it becomes really fun because it gives those players a little bit of just kind of that one on one opportunity as well, which can be really fun. I honestly I would say if I had a really I mean that's an ideal situation about a party wanting to do one thing or the other thing. But if I had that situation, I would almost say, Okay, well next like let's end the session, as long as it's not like five minutes into the session, right? Let's end the session here and like you two, we're going to have a session next week, and then you two, we're going to have a session either the following week or maybe we'll do a Saturday-Sunday thing or something like that. Mm-hmm. Let's do that. Like, let's do these separate sessions because these are what you really want to do and what's really going to be fun for you. Mm-hmm. I'm cool with doing that. I agree. Agreed. Uh, that was a really good question, Jay Laptop. I, I appreciate that. Um, let's move on. So this comes from 10 Lawn Gnomes otherwise known as Eric, uh, the parenthetical Eric, as it were. (laughs) Uh, How do you handle rules mistakes or ignorance that end up breaking encounters? And like, I, the reason I add this into this conversation is because that is a problem at the table is somebody not studying their character sheet or being new to the game and not understanding how something works and thinking that their character works a certain way and making a decision based on that assumption and then finding out, oh, man, like, that really doesn't work the way I thought it did, you know? <laughs> and that can, like, really shut down uh, an encounter quickly because it's like the, my whole build was based around how I thought this worked, and now I have to, like, flip my entire perspective on what my character is in the middle of a combat. That's, that's a good question, so that's why I wanted to, you know, ask it well i mean nip it in the bud before you even get there if possible as a player build out as you want to build out ahead of where you are in game if you're level one have level five planned but assume to make some adjustments um but also for gms check your player sheets talk to them about what a round of combat looks like make sure that they know what's going on because if they have that misunderstanding they might go oh shit i don't want to play this character now Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. find that out ahead of time if possible if it happens i think new players new players have that amnesty though and have the hand holding that goes along with it right it's like hey if you know if something truly isn't isn't playing the way that you thought it played you're brand new i'm correcting you here because i know how this works we can take the steps to rebuild your character however you want to play it And if, you know, honestly, if you're a GM for a new player and you didn't help them build their character anyway, that's probably a mistake in the first part. (laughs) Yep. If you're an experienced player and you fuck something up on your character sheet, that's on you, man. Like, don't expect me to know how to play and like 14th level occultist, Haley. Like, when you get there, don't expect (laughs) that. Because I don't, I've never played a fucking occultist. They don't interest me. (laughs) Or don't expect me to, like, know that you can't remote hack at third level, even though it's a fifth level skill. Right, right. Player call out. That's a set. That's the second one we've done. (laughs) I just just think it's really, it's, again, I understand mistakes, especially new people in the system or people playing, like, something they don't normally play. I get that, but, like, After a certain point, like, okay, man, you played a character for seven levels. Like, you should fucking know how it works, bro. Like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be in your sheet doing that. And if I I am, I shouldn't have to look up detect magic, bro. Right. If if I am, that's a problem. Like, if if I'm looking up your spells, you should be excited. You should be the one excited about your new spells. You should be looking them up and reading them front to back. Mm -hmm. That's what I want from you as a player. You should be doing that. I shouldn't. I shouldn't, I mean, generally, yes, I'll know, but I shouldn't be the encyclopedia for what you can do. That should be you. You should be the expert on that. Now, to have that in the middle of combat occur, then it comes down to, okay, this doesn't do what you thought it did. Let's do it the way it's supposed to happen. And if you don't like it, then write sucks next to the spell on your character sheet and don't use it again, right? Mm -hmm. Like in, in our situation... I have a very recent example. Uh, one of my players took a spell that he thought would do something uh, better than it did. And I've gone into his character sheet after, and it just says sucks next to the spell. Because uh, he just doesn't want to use it anymore. Um, yeah, I've also noticed that like sometimes, at least in, in 1E, some of the flavor text of a spell 
kind of alluded to more than it could do than the mechanics <clears throat> of that spell mm -hmm. actually could do. And so, like, I was, it was, it was uh, a Magus build I was doing. I, something that one of the kind of like protect from attacks of opportunities type thing. I thought it was like always AC or like a sword would come out and block it. But it, no, it just says the sword blocks it as you're going away from attacks of opportunities. And that's kind of a confusing thing to try to try to separate just the visual components for what they're describing from the mechanics of it. Sometimes there's kind of some overlap there or some confusion that can happen there. By the same token, I feel like as a GM, you shouldn't like ban retraining and stuff for the sake no. of, like why would you do any of that if it's going to cost your players fun mm -hmm. right i mean right. if i if i built a rogue and i should have built an unchained rogue for example if i'm not going to like let you rebuild that that's kind of like a dick move for me and something that i i should probably just let you do because i want you to have fun at the table too right yeah, well, who wouldn't so, want a, a rogue player to go to the Unchained Rogue first edition? Like, I don't know, man. Some some of the archetypes uh, don't allow you to do that on Hero Labs. Hero Lab call out. Well, I think I think <laughs> I think maybe some of the archetypes wouldn't even allow it with an Unchained Rogue. But that's that's getting that's probably, mired. That's a whole other yeah. conversation. That's getting mired yeah. in rules conversation. Uh, all right, well, let's move on to another question. That's a great question, uh, parenthetical, Eric. And so uh, let's move on to a question from, let's go with Woody, a, new, a newcomer to the GM Happy Hour. Woody. Welcome, Woody. Welcome, Woody. Um, I know Woody. I got drunk with Woody in Seattle. Oh, <laughs> hell yeah. So first time uh, in the GM Happy Hour, but not first time meeting the GM. So I like it. Okay. So the question that Woody has is, do you feel if two players might not be seeing eye to eye and decide to have a conversation that it's okay for the GM to not be present? And I think re referencing our earlier conversation that the GM should be involved. Is there a situation where the players can just talk it out among themselves? Yeah, I don't see necessarily anything wrong with that. As long as you we should all be able to trust the people around us to be able to like, we hope to trust people to be able to express themselves and have just a dialogue with other people. And if we know that maybe that's not possible with just the, the certain amount of people, that's when you want to have a, a GM step in. But I think that it's, it's fine to trust players to talk to each other about what they're feeling. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's any way in which you as a GM have any way of, stopping that from happening if it's going to yeah. happen anyway right, so right. may as well not worry about it i well, mean that's a, that's a kind of an ideal situation for a gm if the players have beef with each other and they can just work well, it out sure. and, yeah. and it's all good then great that's that's fucking fantastic you uh, know don't involve me at all don't bother <laughs> yeah, me don't bother. Like, you can you right. can kind of see it as like a like a almost like a, a legal situation people can can talk through their quarrels if they can't get through their quarrels then they hire a mediator to right. try to settle the dispute and then if that doesn't go out then then someone sues someone i guess I mean, I, I think that all comes down to the table again, like we're talking about. If it's if it's close friends, then that's my th first thing you should do is talk it out. Don't don't bring me in if I don't need to be there, right? If you two have problems and you can recognize that you have problems individually and you can come together and talk about it, don't involve me. I've got I got enough going on in the game as is, right? Yeah. Uh, but if it's a new or people or a society situation or an LFG situation, you know, maybe offer to mediate. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, you know, you still got to mediate amongst your buddies. It you sometimes know? if they, if it calls for that, but if they can handle it amongst themselves for first, sure. fucking can, do that. Great. But, yeah. You know, yeah. But sometimes, yes, you're right. You do need to mediate. Your, for your buddies, buddies are well adjusted, mentally healthy people. And I don't know about your friends. <laughs> we heading to a player call out? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's just like community call out, I think. But... I was going to say, speaking of well adjusted, what's the next question? Community <laughs> call out. Community call out. That's a new one. Um, you get so many right. hashtags. <laughs> all right. So we got one from Sir Newt. Oh, holy Newt. Any kind uh, of Newt you want. Uh, 
what would you do if the party is split on what to do next and unable to resolve it? So I know we talked about, we'll let the party split. Okay. But I'm talking more, or Newt here is talking more specifically about that lawful good paladin and that chaotic neutral rogue in the same party who like legitimately are trying to play their characters the way that they would play and they come to a moral impasse. I mean, that's a tough situation you know, what, a, how does that, how does that get there. resolved? You know? <sighs> yeah. You it's, say story moment and you can yeah. try your best as a GM to like co you know, coax yeah, that you, into existence. But like at some point, somebody's giving mm -hmm. on their character's like it values, kind of separating know? it from the story and being like, okay, person to person, hopefully it's not going to cause a conflict there because like in story, somebody it, always has to give when there's something like that happening or else like a third thing happens and that's usually to the detriment of both parties that are fighting uh but you don't want that to create some sort of conflict player to player um uh, instead of pc to pc um it's that's a, a tough idea because you when you get to the basics of just like somebody has to change their ideals in order to accomplish something that's a sacrifice that's hard for anybody for any character any in any story but it's also going to lead to something interesting so if you know that it can lead to something interesting for your character to do something against what you would normally do that is a moment of growth of change of exploration that shouldn't be discounted i i think that when you have a rock in a hard place, uh, you it has to go in some direction. If it can't go uh, forward for either of them, it's going to go out sideways. And that's the if if they can't make a decision, then I think maybe the GM comes in with a all right, something's going to happen if you guys don't make a decision right now, or boom, the I don't know the NPC comes in and and tries to attack them or something easy. I don't know. <laughs> I think we we at the table need to think about, especially when, when these alignment discussions are brought up, about the, the fact that even with a lawful good character, even with a chaotic neutral character, they're, these are supposed to be realistic characters. There is moral ambiguity. There are gray areas in everything unless like a paladin is doing something that is completely antithesis to their god which also by the way i love like the second edition uh gods and magic laying that out very clearly oh yeah for yeah. almost everything that can take a paladin or even like barbarian stuff <laughs> which yeah. just tell you what is antithesis right if off you the bat. do xyz you're mm -hmm. fucked that's that right just lays it out i love it but unless it's an antithesis, there is a gray area to work in. And, uh, you know, sometimes your paladin has to do greater good shit. Sometimes your rogue has to actually be a good guy because they want to continue working with the people that are you good guys. You just have guys. to pretend to be a good guy. Pretend like so some, you can continue <laughs> working with the people that are good guys. I think a chaotic neutral character could easily also justify like, hey, I need to work with these people because we're way more powerful together and I can get more of the shit that I want by working together with these people. Yeah. Or when there's a your... split, it's just difficult because you have two opposing point of views in the moment. And I think you need to you need to take your players aside and be like here's the range of here's the actual range of like morality here or hey if we're not coming to a compromise either roll the dice or get ready for hell to open up and some sort of demons coming out i don't fucking know mm -hmm. just do something mean at that point but yeah 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 well and I, I, as soon as as soon as the 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 question can i do this can i roll this skill check against somebody in the party everyone needs to be like okay hold on a second how did we get here and then you as the gm need to say roll for initiative <laughs> <laughs> pvp baby <laughs> yeah, or i don't know take i i just had the the thought of like playing a, a like a chaotic character like always doing the the thing that sows chaos take that perspective of what a chaotic person is and 
it's somebody who does something lawful randomly or somebody who does something unlawful randomly. Yeah. So there's there can be some more give to I what think you're instilling a, into your character. I think it's a lot easier for, wild card. Yeah, yeah. for a chaotic person to do that. You know, if you're playing yeah, lawful true. good, it's really hard to bend on lawful good, right? Like, because mm -hmm. specifically lawful good does not bend. You know, like that's their whole <sighs> shtick, you know? You know, play ignorance with your character. It's okay so, if, like, if the rogue makes that stealth roll or the makes that thievery check or that that uh, sleight of hand check. Play that ignorance and have fun with it. You know, well, and also, your player, yeah, I, yeah, player knowledge and character knowledge need to be remembered as separate. And just because you, as a player, see the rogue make those rolls and your paladin or whatever fail it play ignorant that could be fun well, if you're also, unflexible lawful good is a philosophy and like people are people and so even somebody who's like trying to be lawfully good is still a person is going to make mistakes and like i think it's so easy to get caught up in that like if i'm playing lawful good i'm just a paragon of virtue and it's like well no no person is that no person is that like the only lawful good gods are actual representations of lawful good. You're a player character, which means that you have some like massage room, you know, and it's like how you deal with that. Yeah. You know, that's part, a character choice. You either are consumed with guilt for allowing that to go by because you couldn't in your convictions, stop them from doing it. Or you can say that like maybe the understanding of what lawful good isn't what you thought it was, or you could say that like maybe what your original code is, is evolving into a new code, you know, like there's lots of ways that you can play the gray areas of lawful good, but I think it is the hardest one to change, you know? Well, I think if you're the inflexible one, it's kind of on you for facilitating. Yeah, that's that's how I feel. I think if you're the lawful good paladin, then you should also assume the best in people. Mm -hmm. And so whatever, if you're if it's your rogues idea in character, your paladin should assume the best in that person or should, you know, or should want the town not to die over the fact that a couple of egg shells are going to get smashed. Like right. if you're going to be the unflexible one, you need to be the one that can also compromise. Because that's you're creating the difficulty in in that decision making process. So as a GM, I think I think it's it's a good thing for the GM to point out, hey, if you're going to play something that is like very staunchly a certain morality or a certain philosophy, like you need to also just as much as the edgy loner rogue needs to build into their story, the character development to be able to work with other people. You also need to build into your story, the character development to be able to work with other people, even if it's not a hundred percent what your ideals are. And that's what I would, you know, my, my player advice would be, if you're going to be the one that's not flexible, find ways to be flexible because that's, that's going to make everything work a lot better. Don't always do what the rogue does what the rogue wants you to do because you're trying to be flexible, but like be more flexible than that breaks the law. Can't do anything. Don't yeah. be lawful stupid. Well, that's okay, just like being an that, edge. Lord. I'm going to watch you and make sure you don't do anything too bad. Ugh. I don't know. I, I, yeah. All right. All right. Next question. Good stuff. Good stuff, folks. Um, this one comes from, we're going to go with Eli from the dice crisis. What's up, Eli? Any good ways you have of letting characters shake off their emotional baggage before a game? Ways to get the headspace right? Pre-game games, songs, rituals? Great question. I'm going to start with an answer to this one because I have some specifics. So, Heath, you can tell right away when he's not having a good night. So when he's not having a good night, we say Heath. And Heath will often do this himself. What Jam a song, dude. Just like put on some fucking floozies and get hype and that'll get them there. You know, like that'll fucking get them there. He just nice. needs, sometimes he just needs to hear a song and fucking get in the zone. Zach or myself, when either one of us are having a hard night, like we need to talk about it. We're going to have 
we'll probably only record one episode that night and then we'll have a just kind of a friendship therapy talk right a bitch sesh of, yeah i got you yeah, yeah uh, bitch sesh <laughs> talk whatever you want to call it you know uh with with josh we'll just be like all right that was one cheesy joke too far we need, we need to reel it back you know uh but like yeah no, <laughs> I, I think that's a great question what about you guys do you what are the some of the things that you do i'm probably bad at at picking up on when when my players need something like that to be honest uh i think uh I have never just kind of forced a start of a game. I kind of, I'll be like, are we ready guys? And if they're not paying attention, I let them not pay attention for a little bit and see where the conversation is actually going and stuff. Uh, sometimes it, we've done just like icebreaker question games before, or like, hey, I think recently we did a, hey, we're going to do a, a one word at a time story here just to try to like get us thinking and maybe we'll laugh when it, comes down to it and everyone did laugh and it kind of alleviated lightened the the room a little bit um but at for the most part i don't have any good deep advice for counteracting the, the grumpies i bury mine i was gonna say i was gonna say alad we're from minnesota you just bury that shit yeah, pretend it doesn't just, exist and move mm -hmm. on you know, Name a two way to bury game, mine. You'll forget. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got uh, this this thing with everybody in the pod when we just need to get steam out, or you know, we're waiting for somebody, or whatever the case is. In that spare time, we we actually play uh, Scribbly IO. I think it's Scribble .io or whatever. It's Pictionary yeah. online, right? Yeah. Web web browser based Pictionary. Yeah. Was, we could do that for an hour or more, just giving each other shit for an hour, drawing pictures, and by the time we're done, everybody's everybody's ready to go. Just something mindless, something that's not on topic, something that's you know getting us to talk to each other. You know. Yeah, that's a smart. That's I like it. Everybody has our first drinks off air. We all drink around the kitchen table. We shoot the shit. We talk about everybody's day. We talk about, you know, what's going on. We remind each other if it's been a while about what's going on on the show. I give a little recap, obviously, but just so everybody's on the same page. Um, and I think that helps. I mean, it helps. It helps that we're still like in person with it. And so it's not like we're all logging on and. I, I get that feeling a little bit with some of the stuff I've done online. Like I'm logging on and I'm supposed to be like turning on for the session. And for us, because we do that, it's kind of like, you don't have to be on right away when you come over, you can, you know, we, we're going to chill a little bit. We're going to hang out. We're going to mix the gross Patreon beverage we have, whatever, like, <laughs> we're gonna, you know, we're going to chill and that helps. That definitely helps because I, you know, I, I won't say it's for every group, but for our group, for sure, like the average episode, we're not getting blitzed, but like everybody's getting like two drinks deep at that beginning part. And then we're kind of just like pumping the brakes, but that kind of helps. <laughs> I, I will say for us like that, that really helps like grease the wheels and get into the, the fun of the game a little bit. And I, so I appreciate that about my group is that everybody will kind of go to that level because we know that that helps us and uh, and then start recording and then have a good time. Good. good. Uh, I got one more question for you guys and I think oh, then we're going to wrap it up here. Oh, uh, this one comes from Josh uh, from STF. Hey buddy, you know I love you even if I don't love your jokes. You're my boy. Wow. Uh, Play your call out. I mean, I know, like I just, you know, I gotta, I gotta, gotta be real with it. Uh, I appreciate his jokes. I just don't like them. Does that make sense? Okay. Like, yeah. like yeah. they're valuable. Like, they have value. I just don't just like. Them. I've got one at my table. I know exactly what you're talking about, <laughs> all right, Adam. All right. Uh, all right. So to his to your question, Josh. En enough giving you shit. Uh, without naming names, what was the most memorable or difficult problem at your table, and how did it end up being handled? Well, I had this guy who just was determined to tell terrible dad jokes all the time. <laughs> so I invited him on to my podcast. That's what I did. What about you guys? Hard to follow that one. Yeah, what do I do? 
<laughs> these are hard because these actually get personal sometimes. Yeah. yeah. You okay. know? All right. So, so let's take the jokes out of it. Uh, you know, in your, in your career as a GM playing games, what was the hardest situation that you had to table problem that you had to overcome? All right. You guys ready for a, a, a story from my teenage years? Yes. Maybe one yeah, of my, one of my best friends, uh, my, my first gaming group was me and, uh, my friends from middle school. There were, there were five of us and we all decided after one guy bought the, the D and D three books that we're going to try playing this game. Um, and everybody elected me as the GM and we, you know, fumbled through the rules for, you know, we're, we're 13, 14 years old. It, it was, it was slow going. We didn't have anybody to teach us. It was, uh, complicated as a game and a concept as kids. One of the guys at our table, uh, a, a very good friend of mine, and I love him deeply, uh, has really bad ADHD and autism. And when we were sitting down at the table, he could not, he just couldn't, right? He couldn't participate at the table in any constructive way. He always had to throw a big wrench into the gears of whatever was happening. That's just what he did, right? Um, and a lot of times it ended up, we were over at a friend's house over at, you know, 13, 14 years old. And he just like, fuck it. I'm going to go play Halo right now because this isn't fun. And I, I'm not getting my jitters out and I can't handle it. And the rest of us would want to play. Um, what there was a lot of things that happened on his end on the back end, but a lot of what we did away from the table with him, we was like, Hey man, then what we're going to do is we're not going to play when the five of us are hanging out. We'll play when the four of us are hanging out and you know, we get that you don't like this as much and maybe you, you're not as invested in it as we are, but we still, you're still our friend and we'll keep these things separate. Um, that's how we, I handled it. One of my, one of my first, that was like my first big table issue and it stemmed from an, uh, a problem of him and imagine 13 year old boys looking for a hooker on the streets and then trying to get me to role play that whole encounter and i'm like no i don't even know how these things work right now yes on that man get out of here right <laughs> i'm like you get an std and die get out of my table um but yeah it was it was it was messy uh it was probably one of my first real big like friend conflicts in life was was that situation actually but we ended up coming down to you don't like this we do we'll just keep it separate because otherwise it was just him in a different room playing video games anyways. So. I, feel that. Uh, I will say for me, I was the biggest problem that I can remember uh, at a table. Shame on you, Adam. Well, I was a player. It was the first time I was a player. And this is, this is to follow up the story I told last time about Zach as the GM. I was a terrible player the first time I was a player because I could not get out of my GM brain. I, I approached every encounter still like I was a GM, you know? And, uh, you know, I, I had to learn. I had to check myself and like have a conversation with myself and with Zach and with Heath and our other friend who was playing this one. Like I, you know, we had to all talk and I was the person that was being talked to about it and, and like that was a really humbling experience and also a great experience and so I, I bring this all up to say is that sometimes a person will be thankful to have that conversation that you think is hard to breach because I didn't have any intent of being a bad player you know like I thought I was being a good player. I thought I was like super engaged in it. And I was like asking all the right questions. And I was like puncturing all the holes in, in the plot to like find the answer to the plot. And that's not what I was doing. I was not saying yes to the plot. And I was thinking about it on a way to like analytical from a gaming sense, you know? Um, and I mean, since then I've, I've learned how to, to be a good player you know and that's 
you know, I love playing Weldy and I've played in some other games where like I'm more relaxed and like that's my opportunity to be relaxed when I play a game. But it took that conversation for me to, to learn that, you know, and that's when we were all learning. This is like in the first year and a half we were playing, you know. So, yeah, sometimes those conversations feel good for the person that's receiving them, even if in the moment they're not they're a little defensive like if somebody's really really willing to look at themselves and think about it they grow from it and are thankful and like now i can play and now zach feels comfortable jamming more because he's done that conversation and he's been put in that position and i don't know it's just it's worth it to to communicate if nobody has anything else Oh, I, I have a I have a bad uh, experience, I guess, and and it in in kind of the same vein, it turned into a good one, but in the first Pathfinder campaign, the first long term campaign I was in, we had a player that kind of to my very first point in this was one of those I can make it every other weekend type of people, and eventually completely fell off the campaign but because they were an every other week kind of person i kind of every other week learned to play their character (laughs) because we were only a three-person party without them oh okay and my gm was cool about letting us letting us you know keep that character in and you know it probably would have been a bad situation if that character had died (laughs) and then you know the guy came back the next week and had a dead character, but um, but I got to kind of broaden my horizons as a, as a player, and I think that's what really kept me from completely burning out on my completely built-to-buff bard that was the character I was playing in that campaign was the ability to every other week and then every week play somebody else's character, and so we kind of took a real negative that would have been a really shitty thing i mean it was a really shitty thing we were kind of bummed out that our fourth would show up half the time and then stop showing up entirely that sucked but because they never showed up all the time it kind of allowed us to build that character as a group and allowed me to play that character a lot and gave me a lot more experience and ended up making me feel confident enough to GM that same group through my, like the first time I GM'd like, that's what it led to. So I, I I would say like, sometimes you're going to have problems at these tables, but sometimes if you just approach them as opportunities, I guess they, they don't end up, they don't end up ruining your table atmosphere and they, they end up making it better. Honestly, Mm -hmm. like I, the fact that I got the GM for the first time, only happen because I got experience with more than one character and got to like do that kind of thing. And so sometimes it works. I mean, as a GM, just be flexible with that kind of stuff too, I guess would be my advice. All right. Yeah. Allard, did perfect. you have anything you wanted to add or? I can't think of anything. I mean, Allard like... just has lives this blessed life where I'm he just, just plays yeah. with his best friends and has never I, had I noticed that. I've played happiness. with the same four people. I haven't played with, with anybody else really besides uh, All in the Tables and now Lunch Hour Heroes. And I don't... I haven't had any quarrels with any of those yeah. people. Well, I'm about to get up in your face on Friday. Yeah, get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll talk about that next time on GM Happy Hour. Thank you all for joining us. Stick around, uh, all you people listening live, for the after hours portion. It's the real treat if you're here live where we talk unfiltered and unrecorded. Uh, I have turned on permissions in the Discord so everybody can go ahead and Get in the chat and get in the video, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, fellas. Bye. See you guys. Love you. Like a lot. A lot. Like obsessively.